Today I want to summarize the two books I published uh, last year. And these books are, let me just move on here, are uh, the following two books. One is on the, um, on the making of modern Turkey of how the eastern provinces, or eastern Turkey or western Armenia, became part of a, the Turkish nation state. And secondly, th and this was a spin-off project, what about the property uh, of the Armenians in this, uh, in this process? Because this is a subject that hasn't really been studied, um, as far as I know, uh, in contrast to other, to other modern genocides, such as the Holocaust, uh, such as the genocide in Bosnia, uh, and that in Rwanda. So I'd like to uh, do the following. First, I'll talk a little bit as a general introduction to the genocide. I'll, um, I'll argue that the genocide was not one process, it was not just deportations or just massacre, but it was a range, a whole range of, um, of destruction policies. And I count at least eight of them. Then I'll move on to discuss some of the laws and the process of confiscation and expropriation. Um, and finally, I'd like to give uh, an example uh, of, um, of one business, one Armenian business that was, um, that was expropriated by the Ottoman Young Turk government. Much like other modern genocides, the Armenian genocide was not one process. Uh, it can be considered that there were several processes, sequential and sometimes overlapping, that geared into each other, that worked together and produced an intended process of destruction. These were first of all persecutions. Now here's a, here's a map that all of you are familiar with. Uh, I think this is a map of Armenian demography in the 19, 1914. Uh, the darker the color blue, the higher the percentage of Armenians. Now, starting from the early winter of 1914, 1914, Talat Pasha fired all of the Armenian civil servants uh, in, the, uh, in the empire, starting with police officers, with civil servants, with firemen, with teachers, for example, we were speaking about teachers, primary school teachers, secondary school teachers, all Armenians were fired from the uh, bureaucracy. They then moved on, they being especially Talat, moved on to the second aspect of this process, the second phase, which was decapitation. And this was, of course, the infamous arrests of April 24, 1915, when they ordered the complete uh, decapitation and destruction of the elites, starting with Istanbul uh, and replicated um, in, the, in the provinces. Now, I'd like to say two things about this decapitation. I think this is extremely important. Uh, first of all, these were extremely systematic. There were lists of uh, men to be, and there were all men, to be arrested and to be executed, and these lists were also sent back to, uh, to Istanbul for corroboration. Secondly, this was an extremely fast process. Time flies, and especially in the Armenian genocide. In a matter of weeks, the complete elite of the empire was, and by elite I mean economic intelligentsia, the intellectual intelligentsia, the religious elites, was destroyed. Now here are two, two of these individuals. Well, the man on the left, Grigor Zohrat, of course, a very famous writer, and on the right we have the, the bishop of Malatya, uh, Mikhail Khachadurian. Now what's interesting is that if you look at these two men and you study their biographies, they really have nothing in common. Grigor Zohrat was a left-wing liberal atheist, very critical uh, of the church, and then Mikhail Khachadurian was, was a bishop. Um, I would say, conservative, pious uh, individual. Both of them were arrested and both of them were murdered. I think this is quite important. Two men, they have nothing in common except for the fact that they were Armenians. And this is a, really the essence of genocide, is reducing people to their ethnic identity. Now, the third phase was heralded with deportation. On the 23rd of May, so one month after the arrest, Talat Pasha ordered the complete deportation of all Armenians to the Syrian desert, to Derzor. And this is also important uh, because this order was published uh, and we found the official document uh, in the Ottoman archives in which, they, uh, uh, in which they ordered this. This in itself is a genocidal order. The complete deportation of a civilian population uh, to the desert. The fourth process was uh, expropriation the property and, and, and dispossession process. And I'll talk about that, uh, especially in the second half of my uh, lecture today. The fifth phase was, of course, mass murder. Starting from uh, the summer of 1915 on, special units 
these men uh, began murdering Armenian civilians uh, in, throughout the empire. Now, so far of these men, the special organization, the Teshkilat Mahsusa, we had very little information. What kind of organization is this? How were they set up? Um, I found this, this document um, or this photo in the Ottoman archives where it was published in a war journal. And what's interesting is that we see that they were all dressed in the same uniforms, first of all. And secondly, what is extremely important, they are standing in front of the war ministry in Istanbul. So no longer can the government say, well, we had nothing to do with these. These were just some chetes running wild. Why are they standing and posing in photographs in front of the war ministry? That building still exists. It is now the, uh, the military museum in Istanbul. And the list goes on. The sixth phase of the genocide was forced assimilation. The absorption of women and in particular children into Turkish and Muslim households. This is also significant and this is also a genocidal process because it was an assault on the cultural identity of people. By making sure that people could not reproduce and could not um, continue to perpetuate their cultural identity, this was an assault on, on an abstract idea of culture embodied in these individuals. And in a way this is also the essence of what genocide is. Men were separated from women and children were separated from their parents. So you're breaking up the most essential ties in human beings. Um, and um, this was also, let's say, the sixth phase of the genocide. The list goes on. Then we have the seventh phase of the genocide, the famine crime. Um, starting from 1916 on, as Armenians continued to roll into, into Derzor, Talat Pasha and his men organized a, an, an artificial famine an artificial famine zone. So people, people were put into a region and they prohibited bread from being baked and, re and reaching those, um, those people in these particular compartments. And this is extremely important here because here you distinguish, you can distinguish what makes it genocidal. The Turkish people that were living in Derzor were given bread. But to the Armenians it was prohibited to buy bread and very often to import it. Now why did they do that? You might want to think. And of course, there's no uh, question about the intention behind this, um, this policy. And I'm still not finished. The final phase of the genocide, one can say, was the assault on material culture or architecture. Starting from 1915 on, but th this is a policy that continued well into the 1920s and 30s, the Turkish government started destroying churches and monasteries. Now here's only one example. On the left, you see Surpovanes Monastery in Alashkirt, and on the right, you see the same spot in 1970. And what is left of this monastery is just the, well, the foundations only, isn't it? And you can clearly see that this is the same place, because some of my students have asked me, how do we know that this is the same place? I'll show it to you in a minute. Here is a, there's a black stripe here on the mountain. You see the same one here, right there. And these, these are the foundations of this, um, of this monastery. Now these policies, you might say, are entirely different. That's true. But they also converge. They, together, and only together, they produce an intended and coherent process of destruction. And by the end of the war, the approximately 2,900 Armenian settlements were depopulated, and about a million Armenians were dead. Now I'd like to move on to the the dispossession policy. Of course, all these other, these eight phases and factors have to be studied, and they have been studied in quite detail. But I'd like to look at the at two, two important uh, processes before I move to the dispossession. First of all, I believe that the, the, the genocide itself was a, what we call a racialization of Armenian identity. And you can see that by looking at these circles. They started with the smaller circle, the elites, then they expanded that to include all the men, then they expanded that to include women and children. And then they expanded that to including also Armenian Catholics and Armenian Protestants, many of whom protested and said that they have nothing, they have nothing to do with the Armenian millet, but they were deported and uh, massacred as well. And finally, they even included Armenians who, converted, who had converted to Islam. In 1916-17, Talat Pasha sends an order out to the whole country saying, Armenians who converted to Islam only did so to escape the deportation. 
they have to be found, they have to be arrested, and they have to be deported. So that's interesting. That means that you could, you could do nothing as an Armenian to get out of this deportation and to get out of this, um, this category. But there's some, there's some interesting counter evidence as well, and I'd like to discuss that with you. Look at this map that was published by Ara Sarafian. It's a map based on the secret handbook of Talat Pasha, which was given to his widow and then later given to a Turkish journalist, Murat Pardakçı. And it shows the death rates per province. Now, you see the pie charts. Black is Armenians who were murdered in the provinces. Dark gray is Armenians who were deported, but they were still alive. And light gray is Armenians who were never deported. Now, I'd like to, in, to invite you to look at the differences here. What do you notice? What you notice immediately, I think, in this, in this map, is that the death rates in the, in the east are much higher than in the west. Of course, some people have used this as a denialist argument by claiming, well, look, here in Ankara, 29% of the Armenians were never deported. Therefore, it wasn't a genocide. Well, this is a ridiculous argument, first of all. But it does mean that we have to think seriously about this difference. How can we explain that in Diyarbakir province, which I'll discuss in a minute, it's 97% destroyed on the spot, no deportations. But then if we look at Adana, it is 24%, so a quarter, one-fourth of all Armenians who were not deported. How do we explain this? And of course, uh, the secret to this uh, riddle is in my book, so I urge you to uh, take a look at it, of course. <laughs> And I'll uh, discuss that uh, a bit later as well. Um, yeah. So let's move on to the, um, to the confiscation process. Now, in 1915, in May, between May and, and November 1915, Talat Pasha issued four decrees. They were called laws, but they've got, they've got nothing to do with laws, of course. For laws, you need to have a legal process, the uh, separation of, um, uh, of powers, and that was not the case. And this is a dictatorship. They began with a deportation order. And the first order, which was about you know, deport, deporting all of the Armenians, contained a provision that Armenians could bring along everything they wanted. So you have a house, you have land, you can sell it, take, take the money, and then you can go to Derzor, where you will be resettled. Well, that, sounds, that sounded promising. But then, of course, these following two decrees, they completely reversed this policy. In June 1915, the government established the Abandoned Property Commissions, the Envali Metruke Commission. And these were really organizations to assault the Armenian economy. Within, with one decision, all of their property was officially handed over and transferred to the government. Now, they took that decision and they had to fine tune it, kind of develop it a little bit. So they, they took two more decisions. One in September 1915, when they delegated the implementation of this huge plan to three ministries, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of Justice. Because they understood that this is a huge process, who is going to organize it? Well, these three ministries. And they, of course, kept a record of all these properties, and they corresponded among each other. And we have these correspondences. They are in the Ottoman archives in Istanbul, and we've looked at them extensively. Um, and finally, in November 1915, the government had all of the land seized. So these are some further regulations on immovable property. All of the land of the church, for example, was seized as well in that process. Now, I'd like to point out two things. First of all, these laws were morally illegitimate. That was clear even to Ottoman officials. Secondly, they were also un uh, unconstitutional. According to Ottoman law, it was not acceptable to to expropriate the civilian population like this. But of course, to the government, this was a rhetorical pretext. They, it was a frontal attack on the community, and it occurred parallel to these, these eight other processes. Now, how, the, how did they communicate this process to the, to the population? This is an important question. They were duplicitous and secretive about their real intentions. Let's read two, two different orders. One which I'm going to show now, is the order that was communicated to the population, to the Armenians. And the second document we'll read together is about how the government 
corresponded among themselves secretly. Now the first one, here's a public notice from Kaiseri, 15 June 1915. Let's read this together. Leave all your belongings, your furniture, your beddings, your artifacts. Close your shops and businesses with everything inside. Your doors will be sealed with special stamps. On your return, you will get everything you left behind. Do not sell property or any expensive item. Buyers and sellers alike will be liable for legal action. Put all your money in a bank in the name of a relative who is out of the country. Make a list of everything you own, including livestock, and give it to the, to the specified official so that all your things can be returned to you later. You have 10 days to comply with this ultimatum. Now, of course, people read this and they had to comply with it, and they were under force. And in different provinces, this was done in different ways. But this, in principle, sounds rather promising, right? I mean, this sounds good. You will get your property back. But if we look at the secret internal correspondence, we are dealing with an entirely different situation. Here is a secret communication telegram by Talat Pasha to all provinces from 6th of January 1916. And he writes, The movable property left by the Armenians should be conserved for long-term preservation. And for the sake of an increase of Turkish businesses in our country, companies need to be established strictly made up of Turks. Movable property should be given to them under suitable conditions that will guarantee the business's steady consolidation. The founder, the management and the representatives should be chosen from honorable leaders and the elite. Property should be registered in their names to preclude that the capital falls in foreign hands. The growth of entrepreneurship in the minds of Turkish people needs to be monitored and this endeavor and the results of its implementation needs to be reported to the ministry step by step. This is an entirely different text as far as I'm concerned. He clearly states, we have taken your property, we have given it to our people, and you will never get it back. And of course by then, this is 1916, the expropriation was almost completed and um, most of the property was already being given to ordinary Turks. Now how can we, how can we understand this process? Now you must understand that the destruction of the Ottoman Armenians denuded a vast economy of its owners. There were hundreds, if not thousands, of farms, businesses, factories, workplaces, ateliers, houses, anything you can think of. And in some cities, entire sections of the bazaar were confiscated. The abandoned property commissions liquidated all the assets below market value and sold them to Turks. For example, if you had a farm and the farm was, let's say, 6,000 lira, the government would steal it from you and, send it and sell it to a Turk for maybe 5 lira. Now, this is, a pro this is a process that we call confiscation and colonization. So taking the property, confiscating it and colonizing it, giving it to ordinary Turks. And this is important, we have to study it together. Now, there's a few things I can say about each. Notice, sometimes Armenians had no notice. Gendarmes would come to their house with drawn guns, you have to leave now and you're going to leave all your property here. Sometimes they had three days, in the case of Kayseri they had ten days. Secondly, organization or coordination. All of this process was registered very precisely and it was reported back to Istanbul. There were 33 commissions, they all kept books and these books exist even though we haven't gotten access to them, they're in Ankara. Finally, or let's say third, liquidation. All of the bank accounts of the Armenians in this period were swiped clean by the government and put in the treasury, in the Ministry of Finance. I mean, just think about this for a minute. I mean, all of you have, have bank accounts. I have a bank account too. Imagine that the government one day just sweeps all everything you have into their own account. What do you have left? You have nothing. Finally, there's massive corruption in this field. I'll get to that in a minute. Now, colonization, what did they do with all this property? First of all, it was given to the Turkish bourgeoisie, the middle classes, the upcoming people who needed this property. Secondly, it was given to Balkan refugees. Many Turks were expelled from the Balkans and they, they were poor, they, they needed property. They needed land, they needed a house. Third, it was taken by the army or assigned to the army. Fourth, it was used for financing government needs. For example, a bridge needed to be built or these, you know, school needed to be built, 
Take it out of the Armenian money. They say that many times. Take it out of the Armenian money. Finally, it was also used for covering the cost of the deportations themselves because the deportations were not cheap. You had to pay the gendarmes, you had to pay the government, the governors, which also means, and this leads us to the conclusion, that the Ottoman Armenians have financed their own destruction, inadvertently. Now, my last point in the first part of my talk will be about analysis. How can we understand this? And we made a pyramid structure to understand it. For the top elites, for the top of the government, Talat Pasha, Enver Pasha, all of these men, it was about ideology. It was about whatever, it, whatever the cost is, creating a Turkish nation state and a national economy. But if you look at the, you know, the middle management of the state, the, the ministries and government organizations, it was about competition. They wanted to get their piece of the pie. In every government, ministries are competing for budget. So too in the Ottoman government. The ministries, the interior ministry, finance ministry, the Young Turk party, the army, they all competed to get a piece of the, piece of the action, so to say. And there's some interesting conflicts also between Turkish families fighting each other over, over Armenian property. Yeah? Let's say there are two Turkish families living in two neighbors, and there's an Armenian merchant who has a shop. The merchant is deported. What happens to his property? And the Turkish families were fighting among themselves to get that property. And some people even killed each other for that. And these, th th this kind of violence and these conflicts are recorded in police archives. Now, all the way at the, bottom, at the bottom, it was about plunder, about stealing. For normal people, we know from criminology that it's the opportunity that creates the crime. And Palat Pasha created a huge opportunity structure for ordinary people to think that, you know what, it's okay to steal Armenian property. Because, you know, who's going to protect them? And in a way, of course, there was sense. And for ordinary Turks, especially poor people, they were mobilized because they could get rich really quick. And if you imagine yourself to be, let's say you're a poor Turkish peasant, you're living, you're living in a country, in, on the countryside, you have a small farm, you have two cows and a small piece of land. Within one day, like that, you could own a huge farm with 400 cows and a big plot of land. So you can understand that for ordinary people, this was... Uh, this was, a, this was a great opportunity. Now, before we move on to the second part of my talk, I'd like to appeal to your sense of imagination. And I'd like to show the scale of the genocide. Now, here's a map of Mush. Maybe there are some, uh, some people from Mush there. Yeah, there you go, somebody in the back. Um, so, Mush Valley is famous because there are many villages, many Armenian villages in this area. Now, this area is about as large as, about twice as large as the state of Massachusetts. So you get an idea of how large it is. And one dot is one Armenian village. And in one village, sometimes there are 200 inhabitants, and it could be up to 1,000, 1,500. So just look at this map for a second. The government went from village, village to village to village to village to village, to, village to carry out all of those procedures. Imagine the scale of the genocide, and this is only one province. Imagine the scale of the property involved. It's really almost unimaginable. Now, how did this confiscation process develop on the ground? Rafi just showed the map of Diyarbakir. I'll show it again. This is an area that's almost about the same size as well, twice the size of Massachusetts. And um, in this province, about half a million people lived, two-thirds were Muslims, Kurds and Turks and Arabs, and one-third were Christians, uh, Armenians, but also Assyrians, Suriani. And the Armenian community here had, of course, many of them were peasants, living in the countryside, but there, were also, there was also a community in the city that had an economy, that had churches, that had schools, etc. Now, in March 1915, this man was promoted to a very powerful position. He was made governor of the Arbikir. He was a staunch Armenophobe and Turkish nationalist, Dr. Mehmet Reşit Bey. And when he was promoted, they pushed out the old governor. He was too liberal and too friendly to the Armenians. Uh, he established the, this commission to expropriate the property. And this commission uh, was headed by him, by Reşit. And he organized the expropriation of the Armenians of Diyarbakir by making them put all of their property into the church. And this church, Surp Giragos, is 
by some accounts the largest church of the Middle East, was recently uh, reopened. Um, and here, of course, almost all of the property Armenians in the Arabic city had was, was put in this church. Clothing, silverware, curtains, carpets, furniture, sacraments. I mean, you can almost imagine anything and everything. Most of this property was carried away by policemen and gendarmes, including himself. Now, if you read his memoirs, and he wrote some memoirs in 1918, he denies the genocide. Of course he does. But the evidence of his personal enrichment uh, in the genocide is really overwhelming. He was ordered explicitly by Talat Pasha not to steal Armenian property. You have to give it to ordinary Turkish people. Don't put it in your own pocket. But of course, uh, by the time that he was finished with his tenure as a governor, he had amassed a small fortune. He had looted jewelry, precious stones, a pile of carpets, and antiquities. He even stole a piano, and there's no evidence that he p played piano. Now, after the war, he committed suicide because he was indicted by the tribunal. And committing suicide is interesting for a genocide perpetrator because it shows that he, he had a guilty conscience. Only guilty people commit suicide. Now, in 1923, what is interesting is that when he was dead, he had a widow and he had three children. Now, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk uh, took Armenian property and gave it to his widow and his three children, specifically from Armenian property. And this um, is interesting, actually. This property is in Kadıköy in Istanbul. And Kadıköy back then was a very upscale neighborhood. And I went to the street where, because it says in the archives which street this is. And I went to the street and there was this woman sitting on the balcony and I said, Hi, I'm from Amsterdam. I'd like to ask you a question about a historical question. And the woman said, Sure, come up. So I went up, we sat down, we had a coffee, and it was the great-granddaughter of Rishid Bey. She was still living in that house, you know, which is now an apartment, of course. It used to be a, just an ordinary house. Now, he, Rishid was not alone in his genocidal frenzy. One of the most neglected aspects of the Armenian genocide is ordinary perpetrators. Not the organizers, but people who actually carried guns and went out and killed people. Now, I've... We, tr we found some of these perpetrators, and two of them are these men. Aziz Fezi on the left was uh, the, the mayor of the Arbekir. He was from the Pirin Chizada family in the Arbekir. And on the right, we have his cousin, Bekir Sotkut. Now, during the genocide, both of them became unimaginably rich. Aziz Bey, here on the left, uh, murdered the bishop of the Arbekir with his own hands. He, uh, he organized the destruction of the Armenian elite, which was expanded from Istanbul. And he also laid his hands on Armenian village lands. If you travel to Diyarbakir, there's a plain. And on the plain, there are several villages. There's a village of Kabia, Karabash, a few of these villages. And they belonged, they gave the entire village to him because he was so successful in, uh, in the genocide. So it was an opportunity to get really rich for him. Now, his cousin, the man on the right, which is three sons, was an extremely notorious mass murderer. And he became the mayor of the Arbekir. They pushed out the old mayor, he was too liberal. And he was extremely instrumental in the killing of Armenian labor battalions of men, uh, and also expanding the genocide into including the Assyrians as well. Now that's, I think, quite interesting. Now he also became very rich uh, in the genocide. He bought houses, again, in Istanbul, Kadıköy district, uh, and he was so rich. Uh, he lived until 1973, you can see how long he lived. In 1929, major economic crisis, and he sends his son, the boy on the right, to study at Sorbonne University in Paris. That's not cheap, I can, I can assure you. And that son, the boy all the way on the right, would grow up to become Jahid Sutkut Taranji, the most celebrated modern Turkish poet. Now, I find it rather depressing to say that the genocide was probably the best thing that ever happened to these guys. They're, they were deeply complicit in the crimes. They proved their loyalty to Talat by being complicit in the genocide, uh, and they became also extremely rich. Now, how did this affect the Armenians? I want to give one example about copper, the copper business, and then I'll end my talk. Now, the Arbekir, as you can see from its name, is rather famous for its uh, copper mines. No? Before the war, there were uh, 600 uh, copper workers and these people uh, would produce a lot of copper. Now, you can see clearly here from the water, eh? the color of the water, you can see that it's red, it's copper. 
Um, and it used to be taken out of the ground, taken out of the mountains by Armenian business, two Armenian businesses. Those two men were killed in the genocide. So German soldiers, when they were traveling in this area, there was a German general, he said, you know, no wonder we're losing the war because, you know, we're not taking any copper out of the ground. And you need copper to produce utensils for the army or bullets or whatever. But of course he was right, because among the 600 workers, um, almost all of them were Christians, um, Armenians, but also Assyrians, they earned their living in this industry. And um, I have some statistics. The net profit of the copper business was 30% per year. That's pretty good. 70,000 kilos of copper were produced on a yearly basis, only in this province, by 600 uh, workers. You see here the workers on the right, you see the... Uh, well, you, know, you see the boss, and on the left you see some of his churach, you know, the, these boys who are working for him. Of course, now we would call this child labor, but back in the day this was entirely normal, because they would also become later, they would become the boss. Now, after the genocide, 600 before the genocide, after the genocide, there were 30 coppersmiths left in the entire province. So that's uh, 570 of them were killed. And the production dropped after the war, 95% drop in copper production in this province. And these statistics were published actually by the, by, Turkish, uh, by the Turkish Ministry of Economy. Now there's one example and I'd like to close with this. You remember that order that we read together, the order to transfer all the Armenian business to, to the Turks. Now this order came into the Arbekir in, in June 1915. And one example that really epitomizes this policy is the copper factory of Sarkis Kazanjian. Now this was an Armenian manufacturer who used to work, provide work for dozens of employees. You can see them here working, smelting copper. And he had a 99 year lease with the Ottoman government to extract copper from the mountain. This photo was sent to his son in New York City, who was also a copper worker by the way. So we have the photo now. In June 1915, Kazanjian was killed in the genocide when Dr. Rashid's militiamen raided the factory, rounded up the employees, and executed them outside the city walls and threw the bodies into the Tigris River. The factory and all of its assets, the hammers, the anvils, anything you see on this photo, was confiscated by the Pirin Chizale family. Aziz Fezi Bey ran this factory after the war. And if you study the history of the modern Turkish Republic, we looked at the Chamber of Commerce in the Arabic. In 1935, we have this photo from the Chamber of Commerce, just a local like manufacturers and businesses. And if you look at the list of his members in 1935, it complete overlap with genocide perpetrators. And we've studied the, this photo, the man sitting at the head of the table is none other than Bekir Sutkı, the guy who was one of the arch perpetrators of the genocide. So this really is the Turkish national economy in a way. This was the project that Talat Pasha had in mind and he succeeded. Now to conclude, there's a few things we know and there's a few things we don't know yet. First of all, we can clearly say that the Armenian Genocide was one of the most, the largest cases of property transfer in modern history. For the Ottoman Armenians, this policy was disastrous, maybe even apocalyptical, because it was not only about losing property, nobody likes to lose property, but people also lost their professional identities. People who were pharmacists or university professors Especially in the beginning, they ended up you know, swip wiping the streets in Aleppo. So they, there was a certain dumbing down, mo social mobility, but then downwards for the victims. I think this is important to notice. Secondly, well, we have Ziljian now. This is a famous symbol produced. Everybody knows them. But of course, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of this, these famous artisanal families who were very good at one thing. And almost all of them were wiped out, of course. And there are many examples of them, also in our book. Secondly, the Armenian property was used for various purposes. I talked about that. It was given to the army, to the refugees, to the middle class. Third, there were also tensions within the structure of the confiscation process. This process created enormous conflict among the Turks themselves, who ended up fighting over this property. For the top elite, it was about ideology. For the middle management, it was about competition. And for ordinary people, it was about plunder and stealing. Finally, the documentation also suggests, and this is our argument, that the primary objective of this policy was not the property, it was about the people. 
about remo removing human beings and property was a secondary problem. This was a national question, it was not an economic question. Bless you. There, there's also a few things we don't know, and then I'll close. We, we don't know three things yet. First of all, precise figures. We don't know the statistics, and we don't know exactly who owned what. Although we know that there are lists of street by street, house by house, of who owned what. Because Talat asks for these statistics, and they were sent to Istanbul. Unfortunately, the archive of the land registers, you know, Tapu Kadastro Arshivi, in Ankara, is closed. We wrote to them, we wanted access, but they rejected it. Because you can imagine this is a Pandora's box. Secondly, we don't really fully understand the relationship between private property and state property. How much of this property went to the state and how much of this property ended up in private hands? One example is, of course, the Sabancı family in Adana. Sabancı is a huge company in Turkey. They own a university, they have many businesses. And the grand grandfather of the Sabancı, kind of Sion, Haji Ali Sabancı confessed in his memoirs that he, he got property from the government. When he came to Adana, the government gave him cotton fields and he became the richest man in Turkey and his, so, so did his family. Now, finally, we don't really understand, this is maybe the core of the issue, the relationship between destruction and construction. How did the genocide affect modern Turkey's economy? Was there decline because of the genocide or was there development? We don't really know this. And I want to end by suggesting a few statistics that I looked up on the website of the United Nations. If you go to unitednations.org, there's the, um, the World Agricultural Statistics uh, website. And I've looked up a few statistics, it's very interesting. Did you know that Turkey is the world's number one producer of cherries, apricots, figs and hazelnuts of the world? It's the number one producer worldwide of watermelons, melons, cucumbers, and tomatoes. Hazelnuts, for example, this is a fascinating business. Turkey is by far the num world's number one producer of hazelnuts. Number two is Italy, and it's way below. In 2008, it produced 800,000 tons of hazelnuts, and the export was $1.5 billion. Now, this is a great accomplishment, but we know that in 1914, about 100 of 130 hazelnut farmers in the empire were Armenians. And this, of course, how does this relate to the genocide? I think these three aspects uh, of the genocide still need research. So I thank you very much for your attention.